Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the Pinal County Community College District Governing Board meeting. In observance of the current Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines and Arizona Governor Douglas Ducey's Executive Order 2020-52 regarding social distancing, this meeting is being held virtually. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge those from Central Arizona College in attendance. I am Dan Miller, Governing Board President, David Waldron, Governing Board Vice President and Secretary, Gladys Christensen, Board Member, also celebrating a birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Gladys. Thank you. Rick Gibson, not currently in attendance. Dave Odiorn, Board Member. Jackie Elliott, Central Arizona College President. Chris Wadka, Vice President of Business Affairs. Jenny Cardenas, Vice President of Student of, uh, Services. Mary Kay Gilliland, Vice President of Academic Affairs. Brandy Bain, Vice President of Talent and Development, and Mary Lou Hernandez, Executive Assistant to the President and Governing Board. I'd like to call the meeting to order. We have uh, one action item on the agenda today, consideration of the consent agenda. All of the following matters are part of the consent agenda and are to be approved by one motion. There will be no specific discussion of these items. Any item may be removed by, uh, from the consent agenda by any governing member. Pleasure of the board, anything need to be removed? All right. We would make a motion that uh, we accept the consent agenda as written. Uh, I have a motion. Looks like there's just three voting members right now on the meeting. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, second from uh, David Odiorn. Any discussion? All right, we'll continue. Um, Mary Lou, would you conduct a, uh, um, a roll call vote, please? Yes. Board Member Christensen? Yes. Board Member Odiorn? Yes. Board Member Waldron? Hey, I, I <clears throat> fell offline here. What are we voting on? The consent agenda. Okay, I I actually had an item that I wanted to remove, but I lost my internet. So <laughs> I would be happy to withdraw my second if we want to back this out. All right, I I think that's uh, that's doable in this uh, situation. Um, Gladys, are you okay with that? I'm fine with that. Okay, so uh, we'll back up to uh, uh, cons consideration the consent agenda. Um, and I'll say, are there any items that need to be removed? Hey, Mr. President, I, yes, I, would like to, I would like to remove the item on the title line for further discussion. Um, all right, item nine of um, item 2.4, so that'll be a partial. So we'll have a 2.43, let's say, uh, being removed from the consent agenda. Yeah. Um, we, we uh, won't discuss it now. We'll, uh, we'll uh, see if there are any other items that need to be removed from the consent agenda. We'll vote on that and then we'll uh, pick up on the, on the uh, Title IX um, exclusion. All right, so motion, uh, looking for a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda minus item 2.43. I'll make that motion again that we accept as written with that ex one exception. And I will second. Motion. Second. All right, uh, second from Dave. All right, any discussion? Well, I actually can't discuss this one just yet. Um, so um, Mary Lou, would you uh, conduct a roll call vote, please? Yes. Board member Christensen? Yes. Board member Odiorn? Yes. Board member Waldron? Yes. Board President Miller? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right, great. All right, on to um, item 2.43. Uh, David, you want to open the discussion? David Waldron? Uh, actually, yes, I'll, uh, Ms. President, I'll just go ahead and defer to you with the discussion that we wanted to have with this item. Um, all right, there were a couple things that uh, we we're kind of uh, looking at on uh, not the Title IX um, policy is is out of place, but maybe there's an opportunity there to um, uh, 
um, to make that a procedure of a governance policy, possibly, um, since the title for us to be in compliance with Title IX, um, there could be changes, uh, you know, from the federal, state government, other uh, uh, agencies that may modify that. And by the time the board could get back to a policy that would reflect those changes, it could be, you know, two, three, four months, we could be out of compliance if there was something that we had to, to uh, abide with. So um, I'm wondering if, uh, if it's a, uh, something that uh, could be considered by the, by the faculty and staff of uh, President um, uh, Elliot that uh, we look at having a, a policy that refers to a procedure that's pretty much worded exactly how you've uh, presented this policy to the board. President Miller, we can certainly do that. Um, we, we may be in a situation where we have a policy that directs policy and procedure because the federal government says we actually have to have a Title IX policy. So um, it, in this situation, we could certainly have a policy that directs, um, but we will also have to have the policy as written and the procedure as included. All right, but, so is, is it better to accept it as, as a policy as it's been presented today or? I think what we can do to streamline is you accept the, the actual Title IX policy and procedure as written and as required by law. And then we will bring you a policy that will be a board policy directing that we have the most recent Title IX policy in place. Okay. Um, so it's kind good. of like we did the policy procedure first versus the policy directing for us to have it. Yeah, right. All right, um, any other comments or questions um, from the board? Mr. President? Yes, sir. I'm just wondering if, if we're overcomplicating here, uh, changes in Title IX and so on from the feds uh, don't tend to happen overnight. There's usually uh, a good runway leading up to an actual change and uh, a date future that things have to be uh, in place. I don't know that we are need to worry too much about getting caught up being out of compliance. Um, I'm, I'm assuming this is something we watch pretty closely. Right, uh, that's, that's true. And uh, I think you're right. We wouldn't, something like that of that magnitude wouldn't sneak up on us. Uh, the other thing is that it, it doesn't entirely um, go in sync with the other governance policies that we have out there because it is directing uh, somewhat of an operational um, um, format to it where our other policies are, are not, they're delegate to, uh, to the president, to the staff, and they refer to another procedure to carry out the operational um, commitments. So that was the other thing to think about. Uh, but what I'm hearing from uh, uh, President Elliott is that we, we can accept it as is, they'll go back and take a look at it, and if it needs to be um, re, uh, uh, re, not rewritten, but um, re, restacked, reorganized, that uh, they can present that to us at a later time. Correct. All right. Mr. President? Yes, sir. I would move that we adopt the policy as presented. All right, have a motion to adopt the policy as presented, which would be a 2.4.3, Title IX. Second. Second by uh, David Waldron, All right? Mary Lou, roll call vote, please. Yes. Board Member Christensen. Yes. Board Member Odiorn. Yes. Board Member Waldron. Yes. Board President Miller. Yes. Motion approved unanimously. All right, great. Next item, item three is uh, policies for first reading. Uh, Brandy Bain, please.
Good afternoon, Governing Board, President Miller, Governing Board members, President Elliott, Mary Lou, staff, students, and any guests. This afternoon, I'm presenting to the first reading of the following policies. Student records, which is a new policy, and the whistleblower, which is a revision to an existing policy. Again, this is the first reading and it's for your review only and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you may have. Pleasure of the board. Okay, um, acknowledge that uh, Rick Gibson is now part of the meeting. Welcome, Rick. Sorry for my delay, glad to be here. Quite all right. Okay, uh, the next one uh, reports, item four, uh, Jackie Elliott, please. Good afternoon, governing board members, President Miller and faculty, staff and guests that are joining us here today. As you all recall, early on, we had moved our May graduation to December 11th to perhaps allow for time to safely celebrate our graduates. However, the ongoing uncertainty of the situation of the pandemic, the decision has been made to move the December 11th graduation to a virtual event in order to protect the um, safety and wellness of our students and their families. Um, I would like to uh, and mention that we, we, we hate to do that, but we felt it was best to err on the side of caution and celebrate our students virtually. Also, I want to note that academics has done an, an incredible job of bringing over 400 students and faculty to campus each week in a safe manner for the hands on instruction portion of our students learning. To date, only one student has reported testing positive for the coronavirus and in that situation, the student did not contract it while on campus participating in hands-on instruction. All protocols have been followed and notifications made, and we were very fortunate that it was an isolated incident. I, I think it's important to note that the deans, the directors, faculty, and Dr. Gilliland deserve um, incredible credit for ensuring learning occurs in a safe environment. I think we're probably the only college in the state of Arizona, and perhaps even the United States that can report only one case this fall. Um, right now, the college is operating in what we're calling a phase one of return to campus. Uh, during phase one, that consists of myself, the president, vice president, deans and directors working at our respective campuses and offices in preparation for phase two, so that we're able to check the protocols personally uh, and ensure that we have not uh, missed out on anything um, and so far, phase one is moving along smoothly. We've learned some things that we're able to uh, look at and perhaps implement into phase two. Uh, I have actually had two in-person meetings uh, with face coverings and social distance, distancing. So we've been able to practice that as well in a safe manner. And one last item to note is that the outer walls for the Regional Workforce Training Center are up. I believe I shared with you all a picture and the construction will move to the interior we anticipate in the next few weeks. That concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you, Dr. Elliott. Um, any comments from the board? Mr. President? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Elliott, I know the intent is to move from phase one to phase two um, when the appropriate metrics uh, are there. Um, but given how things are going across the country right now, is, is there a backup plan to move back out of phase one if, if things go badly? Correct. Um, we are following the Arizona Department of Health Services benchmark dashboard and initially, um, I had thought that we would go into phase one in November or phase two in November. I've already, we've already made the decision that that won't happen because the numbers are starting to trend back upwards. If, if we fall out of compliance with one or two of the benchmarks, we will back off of phase one. 
Um, and why, why we've taken it slowly as phase one is, is virtually a handful of people. Um, the vice presidents, myself, the deans, and not everybody, and I think it's important to note, not everyone in phase one is on their respective campus every day, all day, each week. Um, the VPs do rotate being at the Signal Peak campus. Um, and so we are rotating people. The deans are rotating because their office um, situation is close proximity. Um, so we are trying to be mindful of that. So I don't anticipate any challenges with having to step back from phase one. We've all learned how to work fairly well from home if need be. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but we have had those discussions and what it would look like would just be um, probably, I'm gonna say less than 10 people are involved in phase one right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, Mr. Gibson. Mr. President, uh, members of the board, uh, Dr. Elliott, um, I'm amazed that we've only had one incident of disease that has been reported or manifested. Uh, to what kinds of uh, protocols or how, what do we attribute that to? Wow, a lot of planning on the part of academics to schedule students in small groups uh, face coverings required to and from car and classroom protocols, facilities, cleaning. Um, our police department has done a phenomenal job of checking everyone in as they come to campus so we know who is on campus, where they are going. Um, and, and I just, I, I would like to attribute it to months of planning and being prepared and being realistic and not thinking that we could just bring students on campus without strict protocols. Uh, we're having people sign acknowledgements uh, that they, they do self-care before coming on campus. Um, and so really um, paying attention to the protocols and not allowing a whole lot of people on campus because at, at, at the end of the day, we don't want to put our students at risk unnecessarily. The students need to come and get their hands-on experience. That's the bottom line. They have paid for that opportunity. They need that opportunity and learning. And if me being here might put them in jeopardy, it's not worth it. And so that's kind of been our approach um, from day one when the fall semester started at all costs, protect our students, protect their learning, protect their experiences. And, um, and I think that's paid off very well. Uh, I think some other things we've learned is, is communication is so key when you're planning and responding in a pandemic. And we teams across the campus have come together. They're working collectively. The communication, we get reports all the time, the communication is better than it's ever been. And, and so um, I also think that the, I meet daily with the vice presidents. I think that too has helped us stay on top of the situation and do a situation analysis every day. And, I'll share you an example of something that, that we're learning in phase one that we didn't really think about until we were in it. Um, I was on campus yesterday and working in my office and kind of, I wasn't feeling very well. And I thought, okay, I need to go home because we, we harped that if you're not feeling well, go home. And as I was leaving campus, I texted uh, Ernesto, the director of facilities. And I said, I'm going home. I'm not feeling well. Please do not have anyone go in and cl clean my office. It can sit for a few days until um, we know that, that I'm not ill or there's an issue or I can clean my office. And who that's not something we've ever would have thought of in having to worry about um, prior to COVID, but just a thoughtful leadership team, the VPs constantly thinking about the things maybe we didn't think about, communication and having a very structured process for how we ensure our students learn safely. Hope that answers your question. That was a really long answer. I love it. Thank you very much for the detail. Appreciate it. Great. Any other questions? I know we've touched on it, um, you know, over the last several months. But uh, Jackie, can you comment on the on the morale of the staff? And uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, COVID fatigue. How is that affecting CAC? 
Um, you know, to be honest, we do have virtual meeting fatigue. We have talked about that. We have made some changes. The VPs used to do a weekly meeting with the whole campus community and they've decided once a month. I still do my weekly check in and chat with the presidents on uh, Mondays at 1.30. Uh, we, we're, we have a lot of conversations about that. Um, we still do the virtual happy hour on, on Thursdays for people that, that like that outlet. Um, but it's a real, um, a real issue. Uh, our wellness and health committee have started doing a wellness Wednesday, a wellness break. So they send it out and everybody has, I think it's at 2 p.m. on Wednesdays at, um, yeah, 2 p.m. on Wednesdays, it says take a wellness break. And that's on everyone's calendar to kind of remind us. Uh, Paula Kroc, our benefits manager, has done a good job about sending out information about our EAP program, employee assistance program, um, and a wellness newsletter. Uh, but it, it, is, it is obviously a concern that we have um, when not getting to see each other in person, you don't realize what that impact it has on you. And so I've enjoyed phase one because I do get to see the vice presidents and, and get to interact in person with them. But um, it, it, is, it is of concern and it is on our radar and we're constantly thinking of ways that we can help with with morale um, in this situation. But again, health and safety, we, when, when we remind everyone it's about keeping our students safe and keeping our employees safe, that tends to, to um, ease the, the fatigue a bit. But uh, five hour Zoom meetings are, are exhausting. <laughs> yes, they are. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing the uh, progress on the uh, regional training center um, even though our our uh, future is is somewhat uncertain we do know that we have to prepare for that future and that's a good indicator that we are continuing to move on and, and make a CAC ready for that uh, future whatever it may be so thank you for that all right no other questions uh, we'll move to uh, item number five business affairs Chris Watka Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Miller, and good afternoon to all the other board members and happy birthday to Gladys. And good afternoon to our president and Mary Lou and any CAC family and guests that are present this afternoon. Uh, two items on the agenda. First is the monthly budget reports. In your packet, you'll see the reports are attached through uh, August, which is two twelfths of our new fiscal year. August 2020 shows operating fund expenditures at approximately 11.95%, which is just about a 1% increase from August at 10.96 August from a year ago. And the primary reason for the expenses being up almost 1% is due to a lot of expenditures that we've been incurring for the CARES dollars. Uh, we get reimbursed, we draw down on that on a quarterly basis, and we have not drawn down yet this fiscal year, but we do have expenses that have accumulated in July and August. So uh, that will balance out more as the year goes on and as we start making our quarterly drawdowns of the CARES dollars. Just quickly on the revenue side, you will see that some of the state appropriation dollars, they're lagging a bit. Uh, last year, they were more timely than what we're receiving for appropriation this year and you'll see a decrease in the tuition and fees overall total as well. And that's, that reflects the decrease in enrollment that we have had to this point in time. With that, I'll be happy to answer if there are any other questions on the budget reports. All right, thank you, Mr. Wodka. Pleasure of the board. Any questions? All right, uh, Mr. Waka, if you wanna continue with the bids, please. Thank you. Second item is the awarded bids of $20,000 and over. A handful of them for your review. First one is student athletic insurance, something that we purchase on an annual basis uh, for Relation that is located in Salt Lake City, Utah, 84,899. And that is to purchase the basic and also catastrophic coverage for athletics for fiscal year 21. Campus Nexus Hosting Anthology out of Orlando, Florida, 204,074. That is our yearly fee that we pay to the 
uh, Campus Nexus. It is for hosting our Nexus ERP system. Lighting system upgrades, Clearwig, Phoenix, Arizona, 24,788.58. That is to purchase an upgrade to the lighting system in the Penn Center. Um, it is also for upgrades for the entertainment industry tech program, which is paid for from the Perkins grant. Next one, augmented arc reality ed package, Fraxar, Dallas, Texas, 24,584.13. That is to purchase the augmented arc reality package. And what that is, is all for the welding department. So that is welding terminology that's used. And that is also from funds from our Perkins grant. Usage contact center, tall desk, or talk desk, I'm sorry, Pasadena, California, 30,800. It is to create an open purchase order for usage for fiscal year 21 for our contact center. Next one is a child care stipend, Easter Seals from Tucson, Arizona, 44,460. That is to create an open purchase order for the Early Childhood Center uh, stipends for fiscal year 21. That is paid through the Easter Blakes. Uh, it's a grant that pays the students um, that are Pell recipients their tuition subsidy. Janitorial supplies from Waxy, Mesa, Arizona, 27,500. That is an open purchase order for uh, janitorial supplies for fiscal year 21. And electronic maintenance supplies, electrical supply, Phoenix, Arizona, 27,500. That is also to open a purchase order for supplies for electrical maintenance needs for fiscal year 21. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on our bids. All right, great, thank you, Chris. Any thank questions you. for Mr. Walker? Uh, the augmented reality one, Chris, comes to uh, front and center for me. Is that um, is that simulated welding training? Is that what that's about, or do you know? <laughs> to be honest, uh, I'm not sure what that is in the welding department. Um, All right, that may be a simulation package, but I have to get back to you on that, or perhaps Mary Kay might know. But otherwise, um, that would be a good guess on my part as well. Yeah. Well, it's. Augmented reality is exciting on the list that we're, uh, we're embracing that uh, uh, technology. So yeah, very exciting. Mm -hmm. All right, another questions. Uh, we'll move to item six, uh, monitoring reports. Uh, Dr. Jenny Cardenas and Dr. Mary Kay Gilliland. All right. It says my video's on, but I don't see myself on, which is interesting. There we go. Okay, so Mary Kay and I are going to um, go over the monitoring report for today. So um, good afternoon, President Miller, Governing Board, um, Dr. Elliott, colleagues and guests who have joined us today. So the monitoring report that we will discuss today is actually for outcome number two, which is access, um, ensuring that all Pinal County residents have access to high quality, innovative educational programs and opportunities for advanced degrees. So the four sections um, that we're gonna talk about are, are fairly closely related and having to do with our high school population and underserved students um, within our county. So the first, um, if you can change the slide, please. Um, as I indicated, the four that we're gonna talk about today, one is our college going students. So these are the students who are directly out of high school who have just graduated from high school. Um, the next will be our underserved student population and then our actual high school student enrollment in high school programs and then uh, the number of four-year pathways in Pinal County. So next slide, please. So the first, as I indicated before, is this is a group of students who are college going. So out of all of our Pinal County high schools, these are the students who have earned their um, high school diplomas and are, and are now ready to go into the workforce uh, to community colleges and universities. And um, as the graph indicates, we, have, we do have a goal of 40% um, that was, um, created for the 2018 to 21 strategic plan. And we have seen an increase from last year uh, from 19 to 23%. So we are on our way to, towards reaching that goal, but um, still have much work to do. And we'll talk about a lot of the, the recent and, and planned improvements that we have in that area. Um, next slide, please. The second is our group of underserved students. And again, the board had set um, a goal of 60% for our underserved students uh, for the strategic plan. 
And we have shown that although enrollment has declined over the last few years, um, it's a very good indicator when we see that the students that we are serving, we've increased in the population of underserved students um, who are joining us at CAC to, to earn their education. So we did increase from 47% to 51%, also another good indication that we're on our way uh, towards reaching the goal of, of 60% there. And I'm gonna wait until the end to talk about all the, the great things that are happening. Um, the next one is 2.3, and that is our high school enrollment and our high school programs. And, and this we've actually seen um, quite a change. One of the, the indicators that we had um, where we, we believe has contributed to the decline that we saw from 903 students to 801 students is actually the fact that we have, uh, we are no longer providing um, or allowing students to take developmental ed courses while they're in our high school programs. And this has been a change for us in that we are trying to work um, other ways of helping students to um, go through boot camps and resources that can be offered to them. But in our high school programs, they are only college ready um, courses that are accepted here so, or that are, that are being counted. So lots of work is really going into um, the types of courses that students are taking and really organizing the, the courses uh, towards a goal um, that students are taking in high school. So we do um, feel that this is an area that we are definitely focusing on. You'll hear a lot of great things that, uh, that we're working on in this area to increase that and reach and exceed the, the thousand students um, enrolled in our high school programs. And that's both for concurrent enrollment and our dual enrollment programs, um, both. Um, the last, uh, next slide please, is the number of four-year pathways in Pinal County. And Mary Kay is gonna talk about this a little bit more uh, towards the end, we actually, um, have had oops, an increase there from uh, 10 to 11. So our goal was 10. We met it last year and we've since included one additional pathway. Um, and again, Mary, Mary Kay will address that. So we've definitely had some, some great progress in the area of pathway uh, to four-year um, institution. So overall, um, we've had lots of conversations in the, in the last couple of years and definitely in the last year, we've We've seen lots of changes, um, you know, as Dr. Elliott spoke about uh, the changes due to COVID-19 and having to switch to a virtual environment and provide services in a virtual environment. So on top of, of making those types of changes and meeting students where they are, um, we also were still continuing with innovating and, and trying um, to really streamline a lot, a lot of our processes. So the first, um, if you recall last year um, and even the year before, we had talked about CAC Connect programs where we have recruiters and advisors and financial aid staff that are able to work with students um, in the high schools. We've still continued with that and we'll continue to increase those services. We've now just shifted to a virtual environment. So again, meeting students in the way that, that they can meet us. Um, also shifting to virtual opportunities when it comes to orientations and tours and um, the Carol rallies and parent meetings and ways to um, to interact with students and their parents, um, as well as the high school high school staff. Um, I know that we've talked a little bit before about the chat options, but one additional chat option that we've had. Um, we've in the past had our Vicaro chat. So Vicaro Pete, you could go on during certain time periods and type in questions. And one of our um, amazing staff who, who staff that area would respond back and answer the question. Um, we've increased that now to have a secondary component to the chat, which is an artificial intelligence component so that students can get answers to their questions 24 seven. Um, the exciting thing with this is it's a system that learns from the questions that are asked. So we've put in tons of different information uh, regarding five key areas. So financial aid, enrollment, advising, um, registration, or admissions, and student accounts. I know that was six, but combine two of those. Um, and we, so we've put in lots of information about those. And as students ask questions, we're able to say, hey, you know, we're hearing a lot of students are asking this question. We really need to kind of tweak the answer, make sure that uh, the information is front and center on the website, that it's easy to find, things like that. Um, we've also found that there are many other areas that we think would benefit from this. And it had such an amazing start um, that we are now going to expand it to many other areas uh, throughout the, the district as well. Students are, it's been very well received and students are able to get information at the time that they want. So if they log in at two in the morning and ask a question, um, they're likely to get an answer and, and be able to move forward with the process they're working on. Um, we have ensured that Guided Pathways mapping has continued. Um, so much has, has happened in the, with the Guided Pathways project. And one of the things that specifically connects to this is the fact that about a year ago, we had a group that was charged with developing um, a high school pathway which really is not a separate program, not a separate degree, but it's a way for high schoolers to see 
if they start our programs this summer after their sophomore year, as we um, suggest that they do, and take specific numbers of courses and types of courses that they can actually earn their AJEC at high school graduation or just um, right, actually for most of them, right before they graduate from high school. So it really gives our high school students a path to take opposed to just a course that they might take. Um, so that is something that is in the final stages. Um, the group is a group from academics um, advising. I know Karen Hinhetti and Nicole Costales and uh, Veronica Joaquin and many others have come together to develop this. And we think it'll be an excellent tool both for the high school guidance counselors to show students and parents the benefit of uh, taking courses from the college and really taking specific courses from the college to help them to reach their goals. So that's been really exciting. And also expanding partnerships for concurrent high school programs and our skilled trades, which is a different area um, than, we've, than we've had um, previously. Um, some of the planned things that are coming up, we have really decided that based on um, our focus on developing high school programs, it's really important for has, us to have one person who has an overarching um, vision for high school programs. Um, it's been something that has been added on to many people's um, you know, job descriptions and responsibilities in the past. And we do feel that it, it needs to have one um, central focus to look at all of our high school programs. So we're, we're looking at um, shifting a position to, uh, to possibly be able to, to focus on that. Um, as we talked about the development of the pathway, um, looking at dual enrollment processes and streamlining processes, both for how we hire our faculty and also how um, the courses are created, as well as how the students register for those courses. So just really lots of, lots of great things um, dealing with our high school students and really focusing on the help that we can provide to them. So it's, that's an exciting area. We've done uh, lots of work in the last year there. So, and Mary Kay, I know that I talked a lot. I apologize. And now on to you with our Pathways um, discussion to universities. Good afternoon, President Miller, members of the board, Dr. Elliott. Um, just continuing, I actually don't have a great deal to add. Uh, thank you, Jenny, you did a great job of all of that. Um, the uh, number of four-year pathways in Pinal County uh, is something that we really started looking at. Uh, well, I think it was um, actually three years ago, it was the, uh, in December at a board retreat. Um, the board decided that they were interested in measuring uh, the number of pathways that students could take to actually complete that bachelor's degree and remain in Pinal County. And at the time we knew of, very, of two uh, very um, solid pathways, uh, but we were at that time in the process of negotiating um, uh, several new pathways, including our concurrent um, associate degree in nursing and bachelor's uh, degrees in nursing programs with both NAU and ASU. And you know, since that time, we've actually been able to establish quite a few very solid uh, programs, not just our typical transfer pathways, but uh, programs where students can transfer specifically into a degree program, uh, complete everything online uh, and in Pinal County and not have to go somewhere else. So um, these have grown. Uh, we immediately met that, uh, um, that goal of 10 and we are now up to 11. And um, I will have to say that I'm aware of several more that we're negotiating at the moment um, that will accept uh, our degrees, uh, specifically and um, where students will be able to finish that four-year degree. And I'm also very proud to say that in most of these cases, we're able to make those um, transfers into that four-year program without a lot, without degree, uh, without credit loss. And so that goes back to the guided pathways and all of the hard work we've been doing to try to streamline our programs and make sure that every credit counts, which is, I think, as important as anything else that we're doing right now uh, to our sister students and moving forward um, in a positive way. Um, so one more to add to the, um, to the pathways right now. And interestingly, we now have a direct uh, uh, ability to complete an electrical engineering degree by staying in Pinal County, and that is with ASU, and that four-year program is online, which is uh, really amazing. Um, we do a lot of the hands-on work here at uh, Central Arizona College, so that they're getting that as a, a very solid foundation, uh, but the programs along perfectly, and students can actually finish that program in four years, though with engineering, it's more typically five. Uh, so that's our new program. We have several more on the horizon, and I'm looking forward to being able to report about more um, next year. Um, and just as an aside, I think uh, one of the odd outcomes of um, the situation we're in now with the pandemic is that so many more programs than ever existed before are going online and discovering that they can do so successfully. So in fact, we might actually have an explosion of these pathways that are available to us. 
um, we're, we're kind of expecting that things are really going to be looking quite different as we come out of the other end of this. So um, I think Dr. Elliott reminds us that a lot, a lot. But I, as I was looking at this, I thought, you know, we're we're going to be well beyond this number uh, in just a year's time as we document those relationships. So um, I will stop there and leave it uh, for any questions that you have for either Dr. Cardenas or me. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. Any questions from the board? Actually, may I add one more thing? And this is just going back to uh, Chris Watka's presentation. That was a welding simulator that uh, we were looking at that was in that um, in that purchase. It's, it's pretty high tech equipment and it's um, allowing students to do more of their welding preparation through simulation. And then, you know, of course, some purely hands-on as well. So just wanted to add that. I think that's great. Uh, might have to, uh, have to go in and um, just validate it myself. I don't know. If <laughs> But it's pretty exciting. Yeah, um, no, uh, no welding uh, arc, no hazards to odors and, and fumes and stuff like that. I think it's great. They can get a lot of hours out of that. Uh, Rick Gibson, I saw your hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I did have a question about the four-year pathways in Pinal County. Uh, are we far enough along in the development of these programs to estimate, maybe not measure, but estimate the overall um, impact to the people of Pinal County. How, how does the increase in the number of these four-year pathways benefit the people of Pinal County? Um, I'll jump in and answer that real quickly, and then if Mary Kay or others want to share, I think that's a, a wonderful question. Uh, one of the things that we have learned, um, Mr. Gibson, is that our students, many of our students don't want to leave Pinal County. So for them to be able to have an opportunity to get an advanced degree while staying in county, then they have an opportunity for better employment. And it also will increase the number of residents of Pinal County with advanced degrees. And I know that, the, that there is um, information about the percent of Pinal County residents with an advanced degree. So I think, you know, there's the personal benefit that they'll have um, potentially better earnings, but also not having to leave the county, not having to spend a lot of money um, in residence halls if they're able to stay at home. I, we know a lot of our students are first generation low income students. So for them to be able to have an opportunity to gain an advanced degree uh, and increase their earning potentials without the cost of having to go out of Pinal County, uh, I think that that's an immeasurable personal benefit. Uh, hey, did you want to add anything or? Uh, Mr. President, I if I can just make it. I think that, was, uh, that really summarizes it. Thank you, Mary Kay. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, so if, if I'm understanding correctly, the, the benefit to the people of Pinal County is, is that we have highly trained individuals in a, a number of different areas of responsibility, at this time 11, that are bringing their talents um, homegrown, if, if you would, to the people who live here without people here having to, you know, go either go someplace else or there be a scarcity of providers, whatever the resources might be. So the, the people of Pinal County can actually look to these and say, these are programs are developing people and capacity for us to receive some kind of a benefit and it's all homegrown. A am I understanding correctly? Correct. I mean, we're keeping the talent in Pinal County and we're growing the talent, providing them opportunities to to um, what we want to avoid is what, what happens is the leakage out of Pinal County uh, because a stronger Pinal County and economy is better for everyone. But you, you said it very well. Thank you very I much. Add, Appreciate it. I would add to that as well that another benefit to our students is if we're able to show our students, especially in, in this realm of what we're talking about today with our high school students, if we're able to show them the connection between CAC and then transferring to a university um, and help them to make that transition. The other thing that we'll see is a reduced amount of student debt 
So, you know, by showing our students that they can begin their education here, have a quality education where they are not losing credits prior to transferring to the university and able to complete their degree at, at a university with potentially two years or, or less in some cases, um, that's also a huge benefit in, in that students are not coming out on the other end with a, as large of a number of, of student debt. So, student and, debt. and to that point, I think it's our industrial management program or construction management. Actually, students can complete, uh, what is it, 90 hours with us and 30 with NAU. Talk about the financial savings for a student. Was that right, uh, Mary Kate, to 90-30? Yes, that's correct. It's a great program. So 90 hours at the CAC tuition rate and only 30 hours at the NAU. If I can add that program in particular, but quite a few of the programs are actually encouraging some of our students to continue to the four year degree as well. Some who may have decided to stop with the associates and are seeing that there's a benefit to that. First of all, they're finding they're successful uh, when they come to us and they're able to learn in the small classroom setting and you know get very excited about their education. Um, and that seems to be also a huge motivator for a lot of people, but then being able to move on and, and continue uh, without having to leave <coughs> day, a, a huge benefit. So, uh, and, and in a roundabout way, although the tuition is being paid at least uh, for you know, some of those upper division courses to other institutions, we're keeping more tax dollars here in Pinal County just simply by being, keeping people put to. So just, just a small financial benefit there as well for the community. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I think we do see uh, Pinal County continuing to grow and uh, they're gonna be relying on us more heavily to, uh, to educate the, the workforce and uh, keep, them, keep them current in the latest technology like augmented reality. So I think that's, those, are, those are good, uh, important items to uh, keep up with. Um, so you had mentioned uh, the reach out to the high school students. I know they can't come out on campus, obviously. Um, how are you uh, how are you attracting them when you can't really show the you know show the product as much? Sure, I will say that in the beginning it was quite difficult. Um, you know, as as high school students, we're not the captive audience that they typically are being on campus, and we can go into their um, classrooms and and be on campus there with them. But I think we were able to quickly. Um, really shift the way that we were marketing to students. Um, we did start a new email campaign through Constant Contact, so it looks very different. It's very appealing for um, our students. Um, it's just created in a much different way than the, the just narrative that we were able to send out before. Um, in addition, we've really increased our marketing through social media and been able to reach those students. And I think what students have found is that, um, and to no fault you know, to K-12, but I think you know, CAC is in a much better position to be able to offer a virtual classroom and classroom synchronous, synchronous um, learning, learning and all of those different all... things. Oops, I didn't echo there. Um, in a in a very in a wonderful format, and I think we've we've had many students who started to take classes and have realized, wow, this really I, I'm really able to successfully um, take these courses and finish them, where some of them weren't having the same type of um, interaction. Um, in their high schools. And again, I think we were just positioned differently to have offered online um, learning and virtual learning um, in the past. But I think our high school students have, have really done well. I don't believe that we've had much of a decrease um, in that population of students. I think in, in um, anecdotally, what we've seen is we've had more students who are interested in taking courses because of the ease of doing so uh, with CEC. And I attribute that to our technology and to our faculty and, and the work that they've done in, in the classroom. So. Right. And sort of a follow up question. Uh, I remember us having uh, like math and uh, science competitions on um, on the campus that uh, would help uh, part of recruitment with the high schoolers, keep them excited about, uh, you know, advanced learning. Um, are we still doing that only on, you know, online or have we uh, postponed that until we're back uh, live? And maybe Mary Kay or Jenny know, I think those are usually scheduled through the high schools. And we were just a hosting organization, hosting. is that correct? 
Yeah, we have, you know, we have um, actually jointly scheduled some things like uh, our STEM nights and our STEAM events. Uh, but the large math competition that occurs in the spring is, is um, scheduled through the high schools and through community organizations. And then we host and support. So that would be coming up later in the spring. Uh, you know, we'll wait and see if that's even a remote possibility. It might be. Um, but for the moment, most of those things have been on hold, any of them that would have occurred so far. But the, the Carol Rally and those types of events, those still are occurring. So the orientation type events and Q&A for parents and students. Um, so those general types of recruiting events have, have been occurring. And, and it definitely has been much easier now that most of the K-12s have a system in place of communicating with their students. And they're kind of more settled into how to get information to the students and parents. Um, we've, we've seen some great success with that. Um, our online orientation had been set up before, but we definitely saw a, a huge number of increase in the number of, of students, not just from high school, but all of our students who are taking advantage of those um, opportunities. So. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, looking around the room, see if there are any other uh, comments, questions. All right, that's all the agenda items for, uh, for this afternoon. Um, this concludes all the items on the agenda. The next governing board is scheduled for November 17th, 2020. We'd like to thank everyone for attending our virtual meeting. Thank you and stay safe. Happy birthday, Gladys.